Well, it's somewhat of a relief to talk on a topic that's not controversial. <laughs> so, uh, and of course, I chose the title because I was talking about climate and weather and climate engineering, so I had to talk on engineering hurricanes. Uh, this is basically, incidentally, this, this pointer has an interesting history. I got this as a present, oh, maybe eight or ten years ago, and our cat immediately got it for a toy. Well, my wife's second cat died after 19 and a half years ago, so I have my pointer back. <laughs> so anyway, we're going to, this is not really directly simulating the effects of seeding a hurricane to uh, reduce hurricane in intensity with hydroscopic seeding. Uh, actually, it's a beauty of work that a student at the University of Illinois, who I've mentored uh, by providing her our model and, uh, and a and then, you know, mesoscale conductive vortex initialization code, uh, in which she wanted to look at the effects of African dust uh, and its influence on hurricane intensity in, in the indirect sense, as opposed to direct heating of the environment and things like that. And, the, and based on some work that we did with uh, Sue Vanden here, where we looked at uh, a African dust event that went over South Florida, where we had measurements of CCN, we had measurements uh, sort of, of GCCN and measurements of ice nuclei, uh, we've seen that African dust uh, can become very active not only as uh, ice nuclei, which has been known for quite some time, but the dust can be coated with sea salt and other hygroscopic constituents and become very effective as a CCN and also as a giant CCN that is large enough to, uh, once it becomes wettable, to initiate collision coalescence, much like hygroscopic seeding. Uh, so then, uh, then uh, this is an extension of a paper that I got, and I'll show you the motivation for that, uh, that I wrote in the Journal of Weather Modification, uh, where I had proposed to seed hurricanes with pollution-sized aerosol. I raced to get this out and press before Danny got something out ahead of me, but he actually went electronically and beat me. <laughs> uh, Rams is initialized with the pressure and temperature fields of an axisymmetric mesoscale conductive vortex. Uh, and uh, this code is added to RAMS by Mike McMurray's group. We ran three nested grids, 24, 6, and 2 kilometers. So it was a um, cloud depicting simulation that as opposed to a real cloud resolving, I think, in much, more, much higher resolution than 2 kilometers is needed for that. And we, this is an idealized simulation where we initialize RAMS with a horizontal uniform, uh, one of Jordan's other uh, sound in it. Uh, then uh, this MCD was allowed to go for three days in the zero wind field over the ocean with a constant sea surface temperature of 29 degrees C. So we don't have any of these uh, cooling, uh, what do you call those things? <laughs> the engineered ones that out in front here or anything like that. Uh, they've used uh, two moment thin microphysics. It's a thin emulating microphysics model. It actually has uh, uh, it, it emulates thin microphysics in terms of collection and sedimentation, condensation, and evaporation, and so forth. But it does do within the constraints of prescribed basis functions. So it's kind of a hybrid between a bulk model and a bin model. Uh, it includes two modes of cloud droplets, uh, of which the uh, smaller mode is activated by uh, CCM, the larger mode is activated by the concentrations of GCCM. Uh, the, the code basically has in it lookup tables that are generated offline by running a whole ensemble of simulations with a variety of different CCN concentrations and vertical velocity and temperature for assumed size distributions of the CCN and assuming that the CCN in this uh, case are all ammonium sulfate. We have, we're in the process of modifying it, modifying it so we can vary our, our, a chemical property of using this parameter kappa that uh, Sonia Frydenweiss and her group has developed. And then we also have the GCCN, which are assumed to be sea salt, uh, and they were essentially activated in time they're super saturated. Ice nuclei are basically nucleated uh, using a formula derived by Myers back in 92, in which you have a forecast variable NI. And this, this NI is not varied throughout the simulation, so we're not varying ice nuclei. Well, no, she didn't use the measurements, that's right, in that, but I'm not going to talk about where we did vary ice nuclei response wasn't very impressive. 
Uh, so then she did three simulations of rams where she did a clean case and 100, uh, 100 concentration, 100 per cc. This would be the concentration of haze particles. And fluted enhanced the concentrations from this layer of 1 to 5 with 1,000 per cc. And then she doubled it to 2,000 per cc in that layer. And then later, she did simulations at 500 and 1,500 per cc. And even varying by, from 100 to 101. And I'll show you the reason for that in a bit. Uh, she then also performed simulations for a dissertation. This, the earlier work was reported already, uh, where she did the background simulations. But then uh, she did simulations where she introduced, introduced just the CCN after 36 hours of simulation, so the storm had evolved in a more mature sense, uh, only in our grids 1 and 2, and then it was effective into the grid 3, the refined grid uh, cloud depicting that grid. And she also did that at 60 hours for a bit. So what motivated me to write this paper in the journal Weather Mod was the fact that when you looked at the simulations, and if you look at the, just the maximum uh, wind speed in this curve right here, and we see that uh, for the clean case, the storm was much more intense than the case with double the uh, CCN concentrations. The difference being on the order of uh, 20 to 25 meters per second or 50, 40 to 50 knots. Wow, that's pretty strong. You know, and so I was really quite excited. These are the differences in minimum sea level pressure between double and that. Uh, it's on the order of uh, 25, 30 millibars. And... Uh, so I, I said I got so excited that I wanted to, I immediately wrote some, uh, this, this up in the journal for the modification. So then I said she just done simulations where she uh, used the same levels of intensity and did this were introduced at 36 hours. This is the clean case, and you can see that the winds have reduced appreciably, not as much as introducing it initially, but still appreciable reduction in wind intensity. And so that was exciting too. Uh, however, if the system was really much more mature at about 60 hours, there's virtually no difference between the introducing the, of the of the dust acting as CCN. It had very little influence. So there's some lessons learned right there. First of all, it suggests that we, once you have a very mature storm, maybe like Katrina, that storm is dynamically what I call dynamically stiff. It takes a lot to change alter its intensity once it's in that uh, more balanced mode of, of circulation in that. So that's a little bit disturbing. But then she did some simulations by introducing the CCN to boundaries. Uh, well, this, this is what I just said. Then she did some simulations looking at the in, in intermediate values. And I said she varied CCN from 100 to 101. This is right at the beginning. So we start introducing right in a, this... Uh, little mesoscale conductive vortex. And what we found is it just during the CCN by one, the storm would eventually go off in a track that was quite different. It's kind of like Ed Lorenz, who died last week, by the way, uh, talking about the butterfly effect in the chaotic system. Very slight modifications in the storm still right from that initial elite, um, vortex. Go off in an entirely different, different direction. The other thing, if we look at this curve, uh, we see that the, uh, there's quite a, you don't see as, as monotonic response. If you look at 1500, for example, you get just as low, uh, a minimum pressure as you do with the clean case. That's rather disturbing, isn't it? Uh, I'm, if we're going to develop a modification strategy, you'd like to see a, a consistent, monotonically in, uh, consistent response when the CC is increasing. Again, it's kind of this chaotic nature of the system. The 101 curve, uh, I don't even know, it's this white curve right in here. It, it basically followed, if you look at it, it evolved very similar to the 100, but it just as you got further and further in time. This time, by the way, where you start seeing the departures, is where secondary rain bands are forming in, in the spiral rain bands in that. So all the response is occurring after secondary, I mean, the, the, uh, the rain, the storm has evolved in uh, spiral rain bands. So I said, uh-oh, the results aren't quite as nice as I originally thought. At 36 hours, again, you can see there's, actually, if you look at it closely, you can see there's not a monotonic response anymore. 60 hours, again, hardly any response. Um, 
should so note that the, great, the time at which the greatest response occurs is corresponds to the time at which the spiral rain bands form. Uh, and and Henry uh, has concluded that the spiral rain bands are basically diverting the entropy from the eye wall region, thus contributing to a weakening the storm. But why it's not consistent about that, she still hasn't been able to tell me. Uh, the simulations do not reveal any response to enhanced CCM in the eye wall region that are within a radius of 45 kilometers. This is mainly because the perturbed CCM never make it in that region. They're all washed out by the convective storms. In fact, the CCM concentrations get, uh, I think, unrealistically low, down to about 1 per cc, because she didn't really introduce uh, sea spray as another generation mechanism of CCM. Uh, implications to hyperscopic seeding of hurricanes? Well, the first thing, of course, is the results are are no, by no means monotonic with increasing aerosol, not, not as spectacular as in my earlier paper, uh, particularly for a mature uh, tropical storm. Uh, nonetheless, these simulations do directly simulate small hydroscopic seating beneath the active spiral. Nonetheless, these simulations do not directly simulate small hydroscopic seating beneath active spiral ran bands outward of 45 kilometers. They're affected into the boundaries. And I think a lot of this nonlinearity we're seeing in, in the non monotonic response, because it all depends on the maturity of the compact of cells in those rain bands when the enhanced CCN gets in there. And uh, I think of Seifert and Bering, for, uh, Bering, for example, where they looked at CCN and convective storms, and they found that if the convective storms are relatively weak, not very intense, the increased CCN, the storms actually reduce rainfall. The storms actually were weakened by that. On the other hand, if the storms were more vigorous, as some of Danny's work and our work has shown, you get more super clear water thrust aloft with high CCN concentrations. That freezes. You get a dynamic and invigoration of storms. Stronger cold pools diverts more energy from going into the inner island, uh, into the inner regions of the storm system, and that. And so maybe a lot of this variability is due to that, or else there's some any issues with our T-movement scheme and that. Actually, I had to do a simulation without a second mode, and she got essentially the same result. So we need to, I think we need to emulate the actual release and transport and dispersion of seeding material beneath spiral and ban rain bands. So like uh, we might consider with a fleet of uh, uh, C-130s out in that region. I think the seeding methodology basically has to use droppable pyrotechnics because we can't get pe uh, people to fly beneath the bases of the bio rain bands with, uh, with uh, C-130s and that. We've had enough experience losing, almost losing several planes in, in, that, in that region. Uh, in addition, we need to simulate the natural production of CCN by, uh, by sea spray. If these idealized simulations directly simulating the release of material beneath the uh, rain bands it is, it proves to be effective, and monotonic with increased generator outputs, uh, then the simulations should proceed to more realistic cases like Katrina. Until that work is accomplished, to me, the question is, is open whether there is a potential for hygroscopic seeding to weaken uh, hurricanes, basically it's unresolved. In addition, of course, we've got to worry about ad potential adverse consequences of such activities, and of course, uh, what what uh, Joe is talking about, the process of decision-making and reliability could be involved. But we're a long ways from being there. We've got to show that the science is consistent and has potential, uh, uh, real potential. That's all. I can tell you from her simulations, the variations in total precipitation were less than 5% amongst all those simulations. Okay. And then the second thing, which I'll lay out as the parameters, is the situation with regard to hurricane forecasting. 
and the evaluation of these methods is roughly along the following lines. The people at the Hurricane Center, if you look at their evaluation of past forecasts over the last several years, they're doing a much better job on the average. On the average now, the track forecast for landfall of hurricanes for 48 hours is about as good as the 24 hour forecast was five to three years ago. Does that mean we're perfect? Not at all. But in fact, if you look at the, if you look at, at all of the track forecasts for Katrina, uh, fortunately, as it, you know, within about 24 hours, they were very good. They were dead on. But when Katrina exited the South Florida Peninsula, there, uh, I've got some track forecasts uh, from the hurricane center from the model runs that normally you don't see in the public that were literally put it anywhere from Tampa to Monterey, Mexico. Okay? So that early on, uh, early on, the, the track forecasts were not very good. So again, I'd like each of the panelists tomorrow night to uh, to take that into account. Now, where do we stand with regard to hurricane intensity forecasts for hurricanes? Sucks. Not, not so good. <laughs> it sucks. Not so good. Not so good. <laughs> yeah. The other thing you have to take, and I want every, each of these panelists to take that into consideration tomorrow night, is that it isn't well appreciated by the general public and even some of our colleagues in the research community. Hurricanes can not only rapidly intensify, <coughs> as it happened this past few summers, in other words, we, there, were some, there were two hurricanes, two Category 5 hurricanes in the Caribbean in the last year. In fact, they made landfall as Category 5. And in one case, it went from the like, Category 1 to the Category 5 in like 12 to 18 hours. But the other thing that can happen, the other thing that can happen, which is going to cause, cause you grief of evaluating these, is that hurricanes can also rapidly decon. And this happens very often in the Gulf of Mexico. So uh, these are things that we're going to have to use. And we're going to stir things up for the bottom of the panel. Now, questions for Bill. Thanks for that talk, Joe. <laughs> 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 All right. No, I guess uh, the, the amount of energy in a hurricane is the same as uh, often the same as in a tropical stage. The not the hurricane stage, the tropical cyclone, but the <laughs> tropical storm stage, where the energy is uh, more not focused, but more diffused and hence produced. On rainfall. So, in these simulations of the song and track of yours, do you have the ability uh, to demonstrate that you can produce a tropical storm or reproduce a tropical storm that does not be hurricane intensity? You're showing us that. Oh, well, I think we could change the sounding, and I'm sure we could. But this was, we, 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 triggered the, we got the sounding we know produces tropical cyclones, and then we, produce this MCD in that. I mean, you know, that, that's, you know, I, that's no, no problem. You can't produce uh, the tropical storm is not because From an MCD, yeah, oh, certainly. Yeah. We can lower the SST and bang, we don't have. Yeah. Dr. Rosenthal, you, you mentioned that there's a lot of uh, Correct. And that uh, uh, is uh, described in the very first term. Actually, uh, in that paper uh, that you alluded to, taken as an example, we uh, uh, went into the, uh, into the connection, into the dynamics of the storm, and so that uh, while by keeping the platform, but by reducing the amount of warm rain, they cool the low level, and by that, the air should go closer to the pressure center that goes from the high wall, and that uh, intensifies relatively the uh, thick wind by reducing the overall uh, density of the wind. So, uh, <coughs> what I'm trying to get at is that the uh, wind not only by the big uh, uh, winds or by the sense of pressure, but also by the radius of the maximum of the, uh, the radius of the maximum of the wind. And my question to you is whether you look uh, at this uh, parameter. Oh, yeah. She, she, all these 
responses, she looked at, you know, the, the in fact, uh, as she increased the CCN in those earlier simulations, just looking at three levels of, of CCN, you could see a clear broadening of the storm system and a weakening in response to, in, in concurrent with that in terms of maximum winds. And so with high, with most CCN concentrations, the storms were definitely more focused. But I said, you know, that's misleading because it didn't look at these intermediate fires, which really threw a hook at us and, and surprised us. And I said, I still don't understand that. And until I do, I'm not comfortable with this whole business. Yeah. Yeah. All right. One more. Yeah. Well, you know, what you see is that the two storms, 100 versus 101, tracked each other almost perfectly out, to, out through when the, when the spiral rain bands form. And then everything depends on the interactions in, in the spiral, out, outward to 45 kilometers interaction with spiral rain bands. And so very subtle differences start stressing the storm away from the, the, the storm simulations away from each other once the spiral rain bands form. So just slight differences in rainfall, intensity of the cold pools and so forth, as Danny's pointing out, really can drive you off in another direction. What it must be. Yes. Yeah. Right. You just basically change the rainfall rate and off you go in a different direction. Just the slightest amount. Once the spiral rain bands really become organized. Yeah. Scary, isn't it? Yeah. Thank our speaker. <laughs>